From the final week before Jesus' crucifixion, we read in Mark chapter 13, And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. These words of Jesus, prophesying the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, were fulfilled less than forty years later, as the Roman army first besieged the city, then entered it, and finally destroyed the temple complex. But though the prophetic words of Jesus were fulfilled in the year 70, the actions that led to the temple's destruction were already well underway when Jesus spoke these words in the early to mid-30s. In our study called The Elephant in the Room, we traced the histories of Rome and Israel up to the point where the great Roman general Pompey claimed Israel for Rome in the year 63 BC. Let's continue with that story now. One of the men in Palestine who allied himself with Pompey was an Idumean named Antipater. The Idumeans, also known as the Edomites, were the descendants of Jacob's brother Esau so many years ago. These descendants were the perennial enemies of the Jews. When Pompey conquered Israel for Rome, he placed his loyal friend Antipater in charge of the region. But some friend he was. When Pompey was killed in Alexandria, Egypt, after his falling out with Julius Caesar, Antipater quickly changed allegiances and decided to support Caesar instead. When Antipater was assassinated in 43 BC, he left the rule of the area to his son Herod, and thus the Herodian dynasty was established. This son of Antipater was Herod the Great, who ordered all the babies killed after the birth of Jesus. For several decades, the Herodian dynasty, as it was called, ruled Israel as a semi-independent kingdom, largely free from Roman interference. But that would change with the death of Herod the Great. When Herod died in 4 BC, his kingdom was divided and left to his four remaining sons, who were all far weaker than their father. This brought about an escalation in Roman involvement in the region and increased resentment among the Jews. Among the irritants introduced by the Romans was a census of all the people who lived in Israel, requiring them to return to their ancestral homes for taxation and enumeration. This was the census reported in Luke chapter 2, immediately prior to the birth of Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. As in the days when the descendants of Mattathias sought to rebel against the Greek Seleucid rule, so in these days there were those who rose up and advocated overthrow of the Romans. These men were called zealots. They were not always well organized and might be likened to modern day terrorists. Their aim was to instill instability and fear as a means to accomplishing their political goals, namely the end of Roman rule in Israel. In Luke chapter 6 verse 15, we read that one of Jesus' twelve chosen apostles, Simon called Zelotes, was a member of this group. Some members of the Zealots, who were particularly extreme, were known as the Sicarii, so named for the short daggers they carried and used to assassinate Roman officials. But not everyone in Israel was opposed to Roman rule. At the other end of the political spectrum was a group known as the Herodians. These were generally the more economically prosperous who sought to keep peace with Rome at any cost. In Matthew chapter 22 verse 16, when Jesus was asked if it were proper to pay taxes to Caesar, we read that it was some of the pro-Roman Herodians who were sent to ask him the question. But between the Zealots, who hated the Romans, and the Herodians, who loved them, there was a wide contingent of people who had various opinions about what was right for Israel. Several years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the conflict between Rome and Israel started to heat up, 
but the initial sparks did not happen physically in Israel. The first exchanges in what would become a Roman-Jewish war happened in Alexandria, Egypt, a Roman city with a large Jewish population. In the late 30s, Roman Emperor Caligula entertained suspicions that Flaccus, the Roman governor in Alexandria, Egypt, was not loyal to him. To confirm his suspicions, Caligula sent Herod Agrippa II for a surprise visit to check up on Flaccus. Herod Agrippa II was the great-grandson of Herod the Great and enjoyed the title King of the Jews. Relations between Jews and Gentiles in Alexandria had been tense already, but when the Gentile population of Alexandria learned that the King of the Jews, Agrippa, had arrived in their city, they saw this as a threat and began an uprising in the streets. In an attempt to appease the Greeks of the city, while also calming the suspicions harbored by Caligula regarding his loyalty, Flaccus decided it would be a good idea to erect statues honoring the emperor in the synagogues of Alexandria. But his effort was a total failure. As might be expected, this action served only to inflame Jewish resentment and resulted in widespread riots throughout the city. Instead of placating the Gentiles of the city, Flaccus had only served to incite their enemies, the Jews, Chaos ruled in Alexandria. Caligula's answer to the unrest was to have Flaccus removed from office and eventually put to death. But none of this was enough to stop the fighting in Alexandria. The war between the Jews and Gentiles went on for another two years, eventually spilling over into other cities. Finally, Caligula had had enough. He determined that the root of the problem lay with the Jews, and so, in a decision he determined would put an end to Jewish uprisings once and for all, he planned to have a statue of himself erected in the temple at Jerusalem to which all should pay homage. Various advisors and supporters of Caligula recognized the sheer madness of such an effort and delayed the plan for the period of about a year. In the end, it was Herod Agrippa II who talked the emperor into canceling such plans altogether. But the damage had been done. Though Caligula's plans to install his own image in the temple never reached fruition, the knowledge of his intentions greatly fueled the resentment held among the zealots in Israel. In the mid-40s, after Caligula's death, two Jewish brothers, known only as Simon and Jacob, began an armed rebellion against the Romans which lasted for two years. For the most part, the attacks in this rebellion were swift and unorganized. But eventually the local Roman garrison put down this rebellion. The instigators, Simon and Jacob, were put to death. But all the while the situation was growing worse. The Roman governors in Israel continued to raise taxes. At the same time, the Jews eyed them with greater suspicion and deemed them to be corrupt in their governance. Over the next two decades, the situation continued to simmer just below the boiling point. It would only take the smallest of sparks to set off a mass conflagration of rebellion among the zealots. The spark eventually came out of the smallest of incidents. According to the historian Josephus, in the year 66, some Greeks in the Jewish port city of Caesarea sacrificed two birds in front of a local synagogue in violation of the established law. The Roman soldiers stationed at Caesarea refused to do anything about the offense, and those looking for a reason to rebel found a point around which to rally. The conflict started locally, but as it spread, a low-level Jewish bureaucrat in Jerusalem ordered an official end to all prayers offered to God on behalf of the emperor. Given the tensions, it is not likely that very many Jews had been praying for the emperor, but this was a symbolic act that served to further inflame the conflict. The zealots increased their attacks upon Roman soldiers. Many of the wealthy Herodian supporters were harassed. As unrest grew in Jerusalem, the Roman governor, Gessius Florus, sent troops to the city and ordered them into the temple complex itself. Several Jewish officials were rounded up and executed to flex the Roman muscle and intimidate the rebels. 
The zealots, however, found new support among more of the moderates who armed themselves and drove the Roman army from the city. As the conflict escalated, the Jewish rebels pursued the fleeing Roman troops and achieved a great victory over them at the Battle of Beth Horon in 63. In a battle which saw the death of over 6,000 Roman soldiers, the Battle of Beth Horon is recognized as the greatest defeat ever for the Roman army at the hands of a rebel army. Back in Rome, Emperor Nero saw the need to escalate his response. He ordered 60,000 soldiers into the region to put down the rebellion in Israel. At the command, he placed the future father and son emperors, Vespasian and Titus. Under Vespasian, the Romans gradually restored order to the northern sections of Israel and made their way south toward Jerusalem, a well-defended city with high walls perched on a hill. Rebel leaders who escaped the defeated north reassembled in the overcrowded city of Jerusalem as Vespasian and Titus descended upon the city. But while all this was going on in the east, the city of Rome was also plunged into civil war. After the suicide of Emperor Nero, three different Roman generals sought to take command of the empire. In the end, the year of the four emperors concluded with Vespasian becoming the next Roman emperor. He left the operations in Jerusalem to his son Titus and went off to Egypt to consolidate his political support. Titus, meanwhile, unable to breach the high walls of Jerusalem, sought to wait it out. He surrounded the city with his men. He built walls around the city as high as the existing city walls and effectively barred anyone from entering or exiting the city without his permission. According to Josephus, there were over a million people taking refuge in Jerusalem when the final siege began in March of 68. In an effort to starve the city more quickly, Titus allowed Jewish pilgrims entrance to the city for the Jewish feast of Passover, but would not let them leave again when the festival was over. In the city itself, chaos reigned. Various factions of the zealots with different plans for overthrowing the Romans fought amongst themselves. One group, fearful that any would seek to negotiate with the Romans, burned a great deal of the city's food supply to force desperation and stronger fighting against the enemy. After a lengthy siege, Titus was finally able to breach the walls of the city. The most extreme of the zealots retreated to the temple grounds that were also fortified. In the end, most of the city was burned, including the temple. All that remains of the temple today is the western fortification wall, commonly called the Wailing Wall, around which remnants of the destroyed temple still rest. With over a million dead and 97,000 taken prisoner, General Titus made his way back to Rome, where he received a Roman tribute. When Vespasian died in 79, Titus went on to serve as the next emperor. In the year 82, after Titus's early death, his brother Domitian commissioned the Arch of Titus to commemorate his accomplishments. <laughs>